Welcome to From His Heart, where Pastor Jeff Shreve is in an inspiring new series entitled Holy Boldness, Lessons from Elijah, the Prophet of Fire. In today's message, he'll explain some causes of depression and how you can combat it even in the cave of depression. You know, it has hit some great men. Elijah, obviously a great man, so depressed that he asked God to kill him. Sir Isaac Newton, a great man, suffered from depression. Abraham Lincoln, 16th president, great man, suffered from depression. Hollywood stars, Robin Williams, who ended up taking his own life. Owen Wilson, struggling with depression. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great preacher of the 1800s, he struggled with depression. He would be out of the pulpit sometimes for two to three months because of depression. He said these words, there are dungeons beneath the castles of despair. So descriptive. Hey, what is depression? Someone has described it this way. Depression is a feeling of hopelessness that is not consistent with reality. An emotional state of extreme sadness and intense discouragement that causes negative circumstances to overwhelm and debilitate a person's life. So in the situation with Elijah, we're gonna see depression take over in his life. You say, well, what were his debilitating circumstances? I mean, he just won a great victory on Mount Carmel and God showed up in mighty power and the people said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And they slew the 450 prophets of Baal and then he prayed for rain and there was rain. I mean, the Lord just showed up and showed out on Mount Carmel and Elijah should just be singing the hallelujah chorus. There shouldn't be any room for depression. But so often when you're on a mountaintop experience, you know you can't stay on the mountaintop. When Peter and James and John were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, they wanted to stay there. Lord, we'll, it's good for us to be here. We'll, we'll put up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. They wanted to stay on the mountaintop. Who wouldn't want that? But we don't get to stay on the mountaintop. You have to come down. And when Elijah came down, he came down hard. He came down with a thud. See, he thought that what happened on Mount Carmel was going to bring about a great revival in Israel. That it was going to change Ahab, that it was going to change his wicked wife Jezebel. But he found that that wasn't the case. 1 Kings chapter 19, I'll begin reading in verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In 24 hours, Elijah, you are dead. Verse three, and he was afraid and rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. That's the southern part of Judah. And left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, about 15 miles, and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him. And he said to him, arise, eat. Then he looked and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, arise, eat because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank. 
and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Horeb or Sinai, the mountain of God, the place where Moses received the Ten Commandments. Hey, what do we learn about depression from the life of Elijah? Four lessons that I want to share with you today. Lesson number one, depression comes, often comes when we're physically worn out. Physically, emotionally just spent, just worn out, just wrung out. That describes Elijah. And the Lord comes to him in his exhaustion, as he's there uh, a day's journey away from Beersheba, he's already traveled that 120 miles and just tired as can be running for his life. The Lord comes to him and what does he do? Does he give him a Bible study? No, he ministers to his physical needs. He says, you're worn out. And he's saying things, aren't you glad God doesn't answer every prayer that we pray because the Lord would have killed him. All right, Elijah, I'll kill you. Uh, He didn't do that. What he did was he met his physical needs and he gave him sleep under the juniper tree and then he woke him up to feed him. It says the angel of the Lord, which is anytime you read about the angel of the Lord, that's a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came to him and he fed him. And he gave him bread, cake, uh, baked on hot coals and a jar of water, and he fed him twice. So he lets him sleep, wakes him up, time to eat. He eats, he lets him go to sleep again, wakes him up, time to eat again, and now you can take your journey to the mountain of God. Wayne Cordera is pastor in Hawaii. Great pastor, great church in high demand. He wrote a book called Leading on Empty. And in that book, he shares a story about uh, his church was growing and his uh, schedule was filling up and everybody wanted Wayne Cordera to come and preach and come and share and he's preaching all the time and he's leading his church and he is running out of gas. And he said that he was at an event and he was getting ready to speak that evening and he put on a pair of shorts and his jogging shoes and he was going to jog around the hotel area just to kind of, you know, uh, let off some steam and hopefully, uh, you know, just kind of prepare himself. And he said, I found myself sitting on the street corner and I couldn't stop crying. He said, I was just so totally depleted. I just couldn't go anymore. He had been leading on empty What did he need? He needed rest. He needed refreshment. That's what God gave to Elijah. God's answer right off the bat for his depressed prophet is to give him rest and to give him refreshment. Listen, we don't need in in our struggles with discouragement that can lead to depression. We don't need to blow off the physical and say, well, that's not a very spiritual thing. I need to just focus on spiritual things. Well, you do need to focus on spiritual things, but the very first thing that the Lord does is he deals with the physical. Second lesson that we learned from Elijah and his depression. Depression, not only does it often come when we're physically worn out, but it often comes when we are spiritually fouled up. Spiritually fouled up. That's what happened to Elijah. It says in verse 9, Then he came there to a cave. He's at Horeb. He he went the 263 miles all the way down south to Horeb. And that's where he is. And he ends up in a cave. Now he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, 
a sound of a gentle blowing, a still small voice. And it came about when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Then he said, repeated himself, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Depression comes not only when you're physically worn out, but when you're spiritually fouled up. And Elijah, the great man of faith, the great man of prayer, the great man of God, he's spiritually messed up right now. See, because he had been living his life listening to God, walking with God, focused on God. But now he is filled with not faith, he's filled with fear. Jezebel told him she was going to kill him. And he took his eyes off Jehovah and put his eyes on Jezebel and he was filled with fear and he began to run. And he ran as far as he could get from Jezreel. And the Lord asks him twice, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now I want us to think about three questions from the Lord's dealing there with Elijah and ask ourselves these questions. First of all, are you found in the wrong place? Hey, when you're down and discouraged and depression is setting in, the very first question, are you in the wrong place? Is the Lord saying to you, what are you doing here? I think it's safe to say that the prodigal son, when he had nothing to eat and was longing to eat the pig slop, and came to his senses, he no doubt said to himself, what am I doing here? Why am I here? Do not my father's hired men have food to eat? They don't eat pig slop. Why am I here? The Lord says to us, what are you doing here? Is he finding you in the wrong place? because you've strayed from the will of God. You've strayed from the plan of God. You're not walking by faith anymore, you're walking by sight. When you walk by sight, you get yourself in trouble. And you come to a place where I'm not where I'm supposed to be. Maybe you're at a place and the Lord's saying, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Why are you so far away? You, you as Elijah, you, you've traveled hundreds of miles outside of where I wanted you to be. What are you doing here, Elijah? Hey, are you found in the wrong place? Second question, are you focused on the wrong thing? Focused on the wrong thing. Elijah had been focused on God, but now he wasn't focused on God. He wasn't focused on Jehovah. He's focused on Jezebel. And all he could see was Jezebel's trying to kill me. Jezebel's trying to kill me. Jezebel's trying to kill me. He says to Elijah, are you, are you focused on the wrong thing? You're looking at all these. You're just focused on this that's producing fear. You need to get your eyes on me. You need to remember what Jehoshaphat said. King Jehoshaphat, who heard that the three armies were coming against him and they had soldiers like the sand of the sea and you're outnumbered. What are you going to do, Jehoshaphat? He prayed to the Lord. He said, Lord, we don't know what to do. Lord, we're, we are powerless against this great army that's coming against us, and we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And when you put your eyes on the Lord, he changes everything. Hey, are you in the wrong place? Are you focused on the wrong thing? And are you filled with the wrong song, with the wrong refrain? Now, God asked Elisha twice, what are you doing here, Elijah? He gives him the display in between the two questions with the, the wind and the earthquake and the fire and the still small voice, the sound of a gentle blowing. And then he asks him again, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah gives the same answer, exactly, verbatim. I, I have been uh, very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. Well, all that's true, and I alone am left. That not, that's not true. And they seek my life to take it away. 
He's basically saying, Lord, everything, the situation is hopeless. I tried, but I failed. It is enough now, oh Lord. I'm no better than my father's. Just take my life. And he's singing a sad song. You ever had a sad song stuck in your head? You ever walked around singing with Louis Armstrong? Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. I mean, you're just down, 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 doobie doo, down, down. I mean, you're just really down there and uh, you're singing the blues. You need to get a new song. What do we do when all this stuff comes against us? And see, it's not so much that what he said is false. Obviously, he's not, uh, he's not the only one. It's his whole perspective is so skewed because he's focused on Jezebel. He's not focused on Jehovah. So he is, his refrain is faithless. It's not faithful. And he's lost sight of God. The devil hates praise. God inhabits the praises of his people. And when you hear praise music, it lifts your heart, it lifts your soul, it lifts your spirits, and you start to say, you know what, that is true. God is able in this situation. I don't need to keep fearing. I don't need to keep despairing. It's like when the psalmist had a little discussion with his soul in Psalm 42, and he basically grabbed his soul by the scruff of the neck, and he said, listen here, soul, why are you in despair, O my soul, and why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. You can do that with your soul, and you can begin to praise the Lord. The Bible says, I will hope continually and praise you yet more and more. Hey, depression comes when we get spiritually fouled up, in the wrong place, focused on the wrong thing, filled with the wrong song. Lesson number three, depression comes when we are mentally beaten down. That's where Elijah was. That's why his song was the same in verse 10 verses, verse 14, exactly the same. He said to the Lord, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He says it's hopeless. And you might be thinking in your situation, it's hopeless. My marriage is hopeless. My job situation is hopeless. My health situation is hopeless. My financial situation is hopeless. I'm hopeless when it comes to this uh, spiritual issue in my life, this, this uh, thing that's eating my lunch, this sin that I can't get victory over. It's just hopeless. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not hopeless. Why? Because God is God, that's why. Because God can do anything, that's why. God is still the God of might and miracle. Hey, depression comes when we're mentally beaten down. So this is what you and I have to do. We must recognize and reject the lies. See, the devil moves in when life starts to engulf you. He, he's a liar and the father of lies. He comes to steal and kill and destroy. And so when you are down and discouraged, see, here, here's how the devil works. If you are drowning, he will come and pat your head. That, that's the devil. So he comes at you when everything is going terrible and he starts to pump out the lies. God doesn't love you. God doesn't listen to you. God doesn't care about you. Your deliverance is not going to come. You might as well curse God and die. And we have to recognize those lies and reject those lies and you remember and reassure ourselves with the truth. How do I recognize the lies? By spending time in the book. Jesus said in his great high priestly prayer, John 17, 17, said to his father, your word is truth. Sanctify them in truth, his disciples in truth. Your word is truth. And so the way we can spot the lies and recognize the lies and reject the lies is by filling our hearts with the truth. 
God is still on his throne. God still loves you. God is still at work. God still knows how to part the Red Sea. God is still able. Even in the worst of situations, he is still able. Depression comes when we're mentally beaten down. And then lesson number four, depression comes when we are practically stuck in neutral. What's Elijah doing? Nothing. Sitting in a cave, lodging in a cave, doing nothing. And the Lord has to get him off the snide. He has to get him out of neutral and put him to work. Verse 15, and the Lord said to him, go. That's what he said to him in verse uh, 11. Go forth and stand on the mountain. Now he tells him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint, anoint Haziel king over Aram. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall come about the one who escapes from the sword of Haziel, Jehu shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. I alone am left. Ah, there's 7,000 that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. There's 7,000 that haven't kissed him and uh, uh, given their allegiance to Baal. You're not the only one, Elijah. But God gives him something to do. He's got to leave the cave. He draws him out of the cave with the sound of a gentle blowing with the still small voice. And then he says, go, go and anoint Haziel and anoint Jehu and find Elisha. And he's going to be your mentee. You're going to be his mentor. And he's going to be the prophet in your place although the Lord didn't tell him this, but when he called him up to heaven, God gave him an assignment. You know, one of the big problems with depression, discouragement, depression, despair, all that stuff, it becomes very inward focused. It's all about me. You have to push through that. You have to get your mind off yourself and on to other people. Carl Menninger, the great psychiatrist of some decades ago, was asked at a conference in the Q&A time. They said, Dr. Menninger, said, what would you say to someone who told you that they were on the verge of a nervous breakdown? And they thought, well, surely he's going to say, go see a psychiatrist. But that's not what Menninger said. Menninger said this. He said, if I were to talk to someone who is on the verge of a nervous breakdown, this is what I'd tell them to do. Number one, leave your house and lock the door. Number two, go across the railroad tracks, find someone in, in need, and do what you can to help them. See, there's something about getting out of your house and getting into the sunlight and finding someone in worse shape than you are and helping them that will do wonders for your own heart. God led Elijah out of the cave and God can lead you out too. And it starts by taking a simple step of faith. My friend, we've been talking about holy boldness, taking a stand for Jesus Christ and listen, you can't do that until you know for certain you have a personal relationship with him, until you know for certain that you've been born again. Has that ever happened in your life? If not, it can today. Pray this prayer from your heart. Just say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself, but Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again on the third day. And Lord, right now, I ask you to come into my life, forgive me of all my sins, change me from the inside out, make me the person you want me to be. I surrender my all to you, Lord Jesus. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in 
and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. Today's message, In the Cave of Depression, is available in multiple formats when you call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org. It's from his new series, Holy Boldness. Here's Pastor Jeff to tell you more. Holy Boldness. You know, those are two words that so aptly describe the life of the prophet Elijah. Elijah walked with God, he took a strong stand for God, and he made a difference for God in his day and age. Now, wouldn't you like to do the same in this day and age in which we live? The eyes of the Lord move to and fro, and he's looking for people who really love him, people who will stand up and speak up for the King of Kings. I recently preached a series on Elijah, the prophet of fire, and I entitled it, Holy Boldness. I'd like to send you this eight message series to help you in your walk with Jesus so that you can make a powerful impact in your world for Christ. I hope you'll get your copy today and learn important lessons from the life of Elijah. God bless you. To thank you for your gift of any amount this month, Pastor Jeff wants to send you his empowering booklet, Unveiling the Mystery of Prayer. And if you can give a gift of $35 or more, we'd like to also send you the new eight message series, Holy Boldness, Lessons from Elijah, the Prophet of Fire. Make your gift by calling 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org. Thank you for helping From His Heart proclaim the good news around the world every day with holy boldness. And thank you for watching From His Heart, the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you've messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real life.